Okay, so uh, let's get started. I'm Paul Ho, your uh, host this morning for the first three talks on the future observations uh, uh, in this field. Um, remind everyone to raise your hand if you have questions and that uh, we will monitor them and get to them as soon as we can during the question and answer period. And also for the speakers, you know, we have 25 minutes for your talk. At 20 minutes, we'll give you a warning that uh, 20 minutes is up and we would like you to finish within 25 minutes so that we can get to the questions. Uh, the first talk is today is from uh, Frank Eisenhower working with uh, Reinhard Genzel. So I like to remember that in the 80s when uh, Reinhard and I were postdocs, he had left the field of VLBI for infrared astronomy. And I remember distinctly him telling me that he didn't understand what he was going to do because he didn't know why infrared at that point. But very importantly, he told me there are only two important sources in the sky, the galactic center and the Orion. And we can see that in the intervening years, he thinks that there's only one important source in the sky and that's the galactic center. And what Frank is working on this gravity machine is a fantastic machine, which is, uh, I would say, uh, makes the Nobel prize winning work to be possible within a very short time. They can define the orbits and they can do fantastic things as an interferometer. So we can see that the work comes back to interferometry. And uh, Frank, please tell us the fantastic stuff. Thank you very much, Paul. And please let me try to share the screen. Ah, that's the wrong one. Give me a second. Getting there. Okay. Oh, why are you getting it up? No, I'm I'm almost there. Just give okay. me. I'm there, so I need the uh, the slideshow. Now you should see it. Do you see the title page? Mm, it says starting. Okay, there we go. Good, we see okay. it. Okay, well, thank you very much, Paul. Thank you very much to the SSC, Michael, for the invitation to this talk. It's a real pleasure to be here. And so you asked me to, to talk about the next decade of galactic center observations within the photometry and 30 to 40 meter telescopes. So, so who am I to predict the future? So I don't know, punct. but still I try to, to bring up a few thoughts, but these are not my thoughts. So these are thoughts from the literatures, including the Decadal Review, uh, our team here at MPE, the gravity collaboration, but also from the, the science cases we are preparing here in Europe for the next big telescope, the ELT. So let me go a little bit through the topics in the future. And indeed, I want to cover, uh, want to show you how, how rich this field is. Indeed, it's not only about fundamental physics, black hole, but it's also about the astrophysics and understanding the galactic nuclei and the themes I want to cover in my talk is the fundamental physics. So here really it's about the general relativity and whether general re relativity describes properly what we see. But then it's also going to the black hole physics. And we had the talks yesterday by, by Roger and Elliot, which is about the accretion zone. So the, the accretion disk, the corona, the jet, and the whole of the magnetic fields. And it's about understanding how galactic nuclei works. And so what you see here is a sketch over several order of magnitudes in distance uh, within the sphere of influence, the gravitational sphere of influence of the black hole, but there are stars, there is gas, there are molecular clouds, and all of that has been so rich in the past, and, and I don't, well, there's not much to introduce here, but you've seen the richness here all over the place, certainly on the black hole itself, which was honored by the Nobel Prize, Andrea, Roger, and Reinhardt, which is on the orbit of the stars, but also the black hole itself on the top right, you see the emission from the flares, and on the lower part, you see the, the very rich and complex stellar and gaseous dynamics, which we observe in the future, <laughs> so far if, I should say what is coming is there are two, two big, uh, 
big new things which are coming up. So one which is just started which is interferometry and the other one is the 30 to 40 meter telescopes. And, and you see the points where I think which will make the difference. And number one is we with the big telescopes we will come to two meter per second radial velocity. So we'll come to kind of pulsar science. With interferometry we are on this micro arc second scale already to probe the inner accretion and especially the magnetic fields. And then with the big telescopes we will be able to, to zoom out and come to hundreds of thousands of orbits and, and probably hundred thousands of millions of, of proper motions. So let me introduce first uh, the fundamental physics part and this is what we show here is the strength of, a, of the different general relativistic effects as a function of the distance to the galactic center from the left to the right going out and, and you see different curves for the gravitational redshift, for the Schwarzschild precession, for the frame tracking and I, I show on the left that the unit which is kind of guiding this talk which is the signatures in, in velocities from a few thousand kilometers per second for the orbital motion then to to kilometer per seconds for the higher relativistic effects and in phase two the numbers you should keep in mind this is a few 10 kilometer per seconds and a uh, hundred micro arc seconds per per year and so the, this was the situation before we started with gravity so in 2017 the uh, orbit of the star and the radial velocity on measured it, well, the, the one critical part was missing was the second Perry passage, but there were also two other things which you you know all of that. And, and so number one is that our PSF is, is much larger than the, the Perry distance. So we have crowding, especially at a very important time. And then if you look closely on the top of this orbit, you see that it's not closing. And this is not yet the Schwarzschild precession, but this is a problem of, of the reference system, how stable you can see the the, how stable you can measure the reference system and in the thermometry and large telescopes well they help and, and the reason is shown here so this going from adaptive optics imaging to adaptive optics data to true in the thermometric data and so we have a factor 20 better resolution and entire astrometric precision and even more importantly now if you overcome the crowding limit you continuously detect such a terrestrial star and so as such if this emission is the the mass you have an intrinsically drift free reference system and, and so this helped uh, a lot now to make the first steps towards the, the first general relativistic uh, effects and, and so the one on the left is the gravitational redshift which we measure truly in the velocity so this is the redshift and what you see here is the the, the difference between the general rel relativistic effects and, and just the Newtonian fit. And you see it's a few hundred kilometers per second and even taking out all of the degeneracy, we are now at the 25 sigma level, both detected uh, by gravity and now also by the UC team. And then on the right side, this is a, a astrometric effect, a pure astrometric effect, and therefore now described in, in motion on sky, so RE over time, the elliptical orbit, the Keplerian subtracted, and when the star comes close to the to black hole, so the, the, the ellipse changes, and then you have a linear deviation, and this is what we've observed. And so here we are on a, on a five sigma limit, and actually it's not so, so easy to improve on that over the next years. So this is the current state, and you can do many more things with that, which I will not go into it. The fact that we have not detected any deviation from a, a GR orbit gives a quite a number of limits. And, and so I'm follow what he says reported or, or Sakharov. So you can parameterize the potential and the fact that we have not seen uh, gives limits on fifth force and the particle masses and so on. You also can go to, to equivalent principle tests. And so these are clock tests and the clocks we have are the atomic lines. And so you, you can see whether the clocks go at the same speed. So these are position invariance, local position invariance test. You can compare, for example, hydrogen and helium clocks while you go in and you compare the redshift. And here we are on a accuracy of a level of a, a few percent, but at a very strong change of potential field, much stronger than in the solar system. And that if you want to go even to more fundamental things like is the fine structure constant, so you can look at the metal lines. So this is a, a work by Hayes again and, and look at the metal lines, whether they change the redshift. And so this gives a constraint on the change on the fine structure constant. 
And so this is just started. And we want to go to the higher order effects. And so how do you go to the higher order effects? So the blue arrows indicate where we've gone to have a better position, but for the same star. So how to proceed from here? Should we go to, to stars farther in or should we go to ever better precision? The obvious what you would think is to go down, but as I will show you in a second, it's not so what you see in this little animation is mm, the orbit of a star which is 10 times closer than S2. And you see the difference between the red and the blue. So one is the Schwarzschild precession only, and the other one is the, the lens searing precession in addition, so the rotating space time. And, and you see it's a small effect and indeed it can very easily um, introduce the similar amount of deviation from just the other stars in here. And, and so already one of the known stars would prevent measuring that effect in, in S2. This is what you see on the top and on the left side, uh, similar calculations, I think in this case by, by Merit from a cluster of dark objects, which would put top. So it's the difference that the, well, the, the dashed line is the strength of the Schwarze, uh, the Lensiering precession and the other, uh, the other effects. And so, so what it means is you have to go close in, so to, to be on the safe side are 10 times closer than we are. Now the question is, do we have stars? And the prediction, so this from one of our students' work from, from Weisberg, is we should have one of these stars, which, which is good enough, around the 20 magnitude. So now we are looking for this thing, the close in stars. And, and to the right, you see the, where we are. So we are currently at 19 magnitude. We have a star close in, but only in projection. So this is a star at 62, which is following a linear motion. So it's either in the foreground or in the background. But this is now brings me to, to the ELTs and the spectroscopy. And, and so the left side, you see the mass and the magnitude and indicated where we are, roughly we are at 15 in, in spectroscopy. And so this is the, the spectrum of the star we are observing. So it only has de facto a, a hydrogen line, which is very wide. We measure to a, a 10 kilometer per second accuracy. But if you go to actually to fainter stars, then you get to the, to, to, this is a solar type star now. You have many lines, they're much more narrow. So this is on the same scale. And so we will come to 100 meter per second or better with the ELTs. And then we coming to what I would say, we, we coming to this pulsar science. Indeed, you, you have very, because we are so closer to, to a massive object. Now you see a table on the prediction with 100 meter per second to what level you can, can determine the different effects. And you, you see it opens up not only the lensiering precession, but also the quadrupole moment to a, to a 10 sigma level. And then we can come to, well, this is adapted from a paper by Psaltis, Wex, and Kramer. So actually, we, so this was to show how when you combine data from the EHT, for example, with the gravity stars here at that time in blue, where we only measure the spin. Indeed, I think with the ELT, with this, 100 meter per second, so 10 meter per second, we, we even, then we, we can measure both the quadrupole, it's the vertical one and the spin at the same time. So, so what was indicated back then pulls us from, from Wex and Kramer is, is also stellar science now, stellar orbits with the ELTs. And just to mention, so we will see massive Intermediate, not massive, intermediate mass black hole or heavy stellar black holes, just a rule of some kilometer per second would correspond to a, a dark object of 100 solar masses at a 10 sigma. So we will see the stellar mass black holes or the more massive ones just as a relation to the gravitational wave. But actually you can also uh, look a little bit different. So this was the way I was just proposing with the ELT, but you can also bypass that. And so now I'm coming to a more general view, not a PPN view of, of general relativity. But if you go close enough to the event horizon or the last stable orbit, actually all of these effects become of the same order of magnitude and then you're better or not better. You, you might only want to parameterize. The question is, how close um, is the, the observation described by GR? And so I'm following here this paper by Cardoso and, and Pani. So this epsilon is the deviation of predictions by GR, see of the Schwarzschild, the size of the event horizon, 
or the relation between the, the spin and the quadrupole moment. And so to go there, this is, well, this is the EHT science also. So you zoom in all the way as close as you can. And on the slide, you see the, the way from the radio over the size measurements in the radio now to the astrometry. So we are not, we cannot make images. Our resolution is of the order milli arc second, but we can very precisely measure. And so this is this measurement we had in 2018 when the black hole is flaring every five minutes. Now our data point shown here is that the position of this emission is within a 45 minutes. You see a kind of a circle, which means that this thing is moving at a speed, 30% uh, the speed of light. And, and the interpretation is, is shown here in this artist view, which is that we see the, the accretion flow with magnetic reconnections, which make a, a hot plot, which is, which is orbiting. I'll come to that a, a little bit. And, and so on this very general view of where we are in fundamental physics, you could see here on the left is um, how compact is the object. So this then closed mass now as a function of radius. And now we can see we are within a, a few Schwarzschild radii. This is the dynamical mass now, for example, from this flare motions, but also from the radio. And on the right side is an indication of how well these measurements are described by, by a curve metric. And, and what we can see for the moment, it's consistent. So if I go to this view of, 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 of Cardoso, it would mean this, this deviation or closeness to GR is smaller than uh, order unity. And this puts us then in, in the context of the other experiments, so the iron lines in the EGN, the X-rays, and the M87, the, the ring, and the, the inspire and ring down, all of that we are now of this order unity for GR describes it correctly, but we are not there yet to actually discriminate GR from alternatives. And, and the way forward is also indicated here. So this is if we come to the, the lensiering precession, we already come to this point three-ish issue, when we can hopefully combine with the EHT, the size of the shadow with the mass and so on to a few 10% and then with pulsars and ELT spectroscopy, then we, the end we come to the range where, where we play the same regime as Lisa, but 10 years earlier. And so this brings me now to the, to the Cretian physics. And here are a few snapshots from the past and where we go from here. You see the orbit in the lower part, but in the, the future is now what you see in the, in the top left. This is now in the, in the polarization plane. We also see loops like you've seen in the radio before. And we see the, the flares, the spectral energy distribution. We, we see how flares, we think, are really distinct events from an underlying background emission, it's synchrotron emission. And so if you put it together, and well, all of that in, in a way was covered yesterday, Elliot's talk. So our thinking is we have magnetic reconnections, which for the moment we, we simulate in an in a MHD world with polarization and and we try to understand how this complex physics looks like. And uh, the picture we, we favor from our observations, especially from this polarization loops, is that the magnetic field is, is well ordered. So along this magnetically arrested disks, which you see here in that panel. So again, I refer to Elliot's talk, but also I refer to Richard Blenford's talk. In, in my opinion, I would say we do not know how the, the central engine works in the galactic center. Is it a magnetic field? Is it a matter? What is the relative strength? And, and so measuring the matter is something we can do from interferometry and from large telescopes. And this is, for example, with this infalling, uh, infalling is the wrong word, with, with gas clouds passing very close to the galactic center. And so we discovered one in uh, in 2012, and, and so it's largely resolved, and this is probably unresolved in, in longer wavelengths. I don't touch on what it is, the origin, but I touch on what we measure. And on the right side, now you see the time lapse of a position velocity diagram and, uh, and the Newtonian simulation of the particles. And the important point now comes here on the left side. If you do an orbit fit to the radial velocities and the positions, you, you see that we are not 
not fast enough anymore for Newtonian orbit. We, we are too slow, which means is we have a track force. So there is in there is a so we are probing the accretion flow. We can measure the density. It's lower than expected. And on the right side, you see the different measurements all the way out from the bondy radius to the inner part. And, and so we are on this lower curve. This is what we would indicate, a little bit lower than what was canonically thought. So, and so now you can ask, where is this matter coming from? And we've seen animations from, from Bressler yesterday and from Elliot, and so this one from, from Quatra and, and this team. And so this is, this gas is can or might come from the stellar winds and, 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 and the winds collide and, and the gravity overcomes and brings them to the center. But this is not so clear indeed because there are many of these objects. So there are quite a number of astrophysical questions. And you see here what, what is this origin of this gaseous object? So we have many of them by now. What is the nature? Is this linked to star formation? And this brings us up to a puzzle which is around for, for 20 years almost now, which is this paradox of youth. So we have me, very young main sequence stars or only a few million years old. So, so how can it be that these stars form here or get there? And also this question of the top heavy initial mass function in the Wolfrayer and O stars, this we see farther out, but we don't see that the lower mass stars there despite we have the sensitivity. So this is a very rich field and, and over the, the last 50 years, a, a huge amount of, of knowledge was accumulated all from the, the well, outside the sphere of influence, what you see on the left side on the 10 light year scale to light years where you have the, the stellar disks to the inner part with randomized orbits, very eccentric orbits. And, and so there has over the, in, I would say 10 years ago, roughly this picture has, has emerged what is happening. So you have the, the stars form in, in gaseous disk which collide near the black holes at a rounder pass, like you form rather dense and comparably warm disks, where you form the stars, very massive, uh, top-heavy IMF. And then you bring in the stars somehow, and the mechanism um, uh, which is, is, is thought to do so is the resonant relaxation. So you have external perturbers, so you do not have a spherical potential, but the aspherical potential. And then when you go through it, there's what is called resonant relaxation, which can bring in the stars farther in. But it still cannot bring them so close as we see this, the stars like the S stars. And, and the mechanism which is proposed here is that actually you form the stars in binaries. And when you bring the binaries close enough to the black hole, you have a three-body interaction. You inject one of the stars and the, the remaining more heavy part, or the heavier component, is residing in this S star cluster. But actually, I would say there was not much progress in the last, last 10 years, maybe because we couldn't bring more new data. Some have, have left the field or passed away. And so this is, I'm pretty sure this field will now revive with the extremely large telescopes because now other than with the ferrometry, we, we not only can go deep and then we overcome the, the crowding, but we also have a large field of view. So we can cover the full sphere of influence within a, uh, a single image. And so we'll come to, to 100,000 to a million proper motions. And we will come to hundreds to thousand orbits. So we will be able to, to answer these questions. We will see whether the, the stars in the inner part, the Esther class is connected to the stellar disk just by tracing the orbits on the tr transition region. And then we will understand and do kind of ecology like you know from Gaia for the Milky Way. We will be able to do for the, the central parsec with the hundred thousand to million proper motions. Frank, three minutes to go, Frank. And I'm already on my last slide, which is the one on the prediction of the next decade of interferometry and ELTs. And as I said, who am I to predict the, the future? I don't know. I, I can talk maybe about the next year, what we want to do with gravity. And this is what you see on indicated on the, the top left. Our priority for, for this and next years is to, to get more statistic and repeated observations of the the flare motions, we, we had three of them in the 2018 paper, but you've seen the, the noise is, is still sub substantial with 10 to 20 micro arc seconds. And 
And so we need more statistics to, well, to exactly see what Elliot was showing us yesterday. And, and especially what you see in the middle top panel is this, is this polarization loop. So in the Stokes vault that while the flares are there, we can measure with gravity also the polarization. And so we need to get a hand on the magnetic field. This is my, my, my thinking of where the crux is for the next two years, the magnetic field and the, the flare motion. And, and then hopefully we can combine with the EHT, but this is, you know, better than me. Now, the longer term with gravity, we can already come to, to the fade the stars to start to do the astrometry. This will not yet allow the astrometry alone to come to the lens searing precession. I, I think here we are not good enough, but what you need in addition, like we've seen with the other effects is you need the radial velocity. And so this will come with the, with the large telescopes, the ELT, TMT, GMT, and this timeline, of course, now I'm just giving some numbers, you know how, how difficult it is to, to predict here the, the timeline for this big big machineries, what we, what we have, so to say, in our own hands is the, the upgrade of the interferometry. We've just started like you, what we call an upgrade. So this is gravity plus. So we, we've been awarded the body like, like you, in our case, mostly from the Max Planck Society. And now with this E, so we've started to, to, to make an upgrade to the observatory with laser guide stars to all of the telescopes, better adaptive optics, not only for the galactic center, but also to, to open up the extra galactic wall to, to milli arc second imaging and astrometry. And with that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention and I'm happy to take your questions. Thank you, Frank. So a very exciting and comprehensive talk. Let's have some questions. Yes, Shep, I think Shep, I see Shep. Uh, yeah, so a very quick question, a wonderful talk, Frank. Uh, as we think about merging the NGHT and, the, and gravity, it's, it's extremely important to understand where the emission is coming from, how a cohesive model explains both the submillimeter and the infrared. We see changes on different time scales. Um, and it'll be very important if we're going to hope to make uh, gravity measurements or, I mean, tests of gravity uh, to understand how the periodicities in both wave bands comport. C can you say something about where you see the submillimeter and the infrared emission coming from, how they're tied together? I mean, they're, 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 they're different cooling. Time no, scales, it, for it, example. It, it's a very good question. I, I think they are not linked. I'm also doubtful whether this, how strong these correlations are, which have been measured in the past between the submillimeter variation and the, in the infrared and the X-ray variations. For me, this, this link between the energy and what we see in the radio and in the synchrotron emission, which we see in the infrared, for me, I don't have a picture, really. I, don't I, I cannot envision how the black hole looks, which is, is kind of your question. So I would say we, we have very distinct pictures. So mine for the near infrared and the X-rays is this, this solar flare magnetic reconnection, very localized. So we have quite a number of evidence that it's, it's small and localized. As you say, the cooling times are very short. They are shorter than the orbital times, much shorter. So they are minutes in the infrared or and much short in the X-rays even. And uh, the submillimeter I would not know. Well, I don't know how the EHT images look like, so I can also not, I have no view, I have to say. We have a question from Ramesh. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, Paul, you're muted. Yeah. Ah, Ramesh, muted. please. Okay, thanks, Paul. So, Frank, I want to just follow up Shep's question. So you've got this beautiful... Uh, polarization signature orbiting during the flare. Are you guys able to actually see polarization away from the flares when it's closer to quiescence? We have not looked into it. We, 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 we should. I don't know whether it's closer to quiescence, whether we have enough sensitivity. Mm. 
So it's, it's a little bit the understanding on how our polarization works. We cannot measure both linear polaris, well, we can measure two linear polarization at the same time to get the full Stokes parameter. We actually change the, the instrument configuration. So this we do every five minutes. And, and so now the build up of enough signal to noise for the polarization now depends on, on the brightness. So for the bright part of the flare, or this is what we've shown, this 45 minutes, which we have enough signal to noise. We, we have very clear signatures for the faint part. We have also not really analyzed the data, I have to admit, but it's a good point. I would, would have thought we are not sensitive enough, but uh, we should check, no, very good point. Thanks. What um, would it tell? Could I ask back, Ravish? So, well, my thinking is that probably the quiescent infrared is more representative of what the EHT is seeing. The flare, as you say, it looks like very different phenomenon. Its correlation with some millimeter is less obvious. But if you see polarization in the infrared in quiescence, and assuming it's from the same region that is producing submillimeter, you know, it'll tell us about the magnetic field in particular, how much is the synchrotron dominating, what's the orientation of the field, because you don't have to worry about Faraday rotation. You know, I think it can be quite interesting. No, a uh, very good point, maybe also, I think we should look into that when we have the next parallel observations, because indeed my, my own simple-minded picture was the orbital picture, but it could be maybe much more important for a combined analysis that we actually, we, we get the polarization you at the same time to first see whether we see the same part before we actually go to the speculative orbital aspects. Mm -hmm. Okay, we have a question from Jim. Jim, you want to unmute? Yes, what are the plans for uh, interferometry with the ELT? <laughs> None. No, I, for the moment, there are no plans. It's pretty far away, so it's of the order of uh, well, 10 kilometers, a bit more maybe, I don't know. And, and so I would say, it's too far away for us to introduce the delay, so to compensate. Mm, well, the and, baseline would be very long, right? Yes, but, the baseline is very long. But I, is, I was thinking just of the ELT with an outrigger, yes, so a yes. local outrigger. Right, small telescope next to it. I'm, I'm, I'm not a. Uh, I'm not very optimistic, nor I'm very much in favor of it. I, I think here that the big telescope, first of all, you take advantage of the collecting area for itself in the imaging. I think that's rich enough now to, to combine big telescopes with small telescopes like in the radio for us is, is not so good. I would say it's a waste of photons for the large telescope mostly. And so it's not the, the situation as you have that the, the one big one actually serves as the amplifier for all of the small ones. In, in principle, the physics is, is similar. So also for us, a big dish could serve as the, the amplifier for the fringes of the small one. But in, in practice, I'm, I'm skeptical because you, well, you have very little contrast, so to say, between the big flux and the small flux. And then you run into calibration issues because this unbalanced flux is not good for us, I would say. Okay, uh, we are running out of time. I see Daryl with hands up. Uh, do you have a short one or? I think it's short. Okay. I think it's short, Paul, thank you. Um, so it, Frank, can you just tell us a little bit on the maybe shorter horizon, what the plans are for gravity and the VLT and sort of where, what you envision the next couple of years looking like and, and just sort of how the system is progressing in the nearer term. Well, what is good is that we are observing. So actually we will start with the GC season now in March. So gravity is up. Now the near term is what we do is we, we now equip all the telescopes with new adaptive optics. And then with laser guides does this within the, the next five years. And, and so our next thing is, is to do off-axis fringe tracking. So this is the equivalent of adaptive optics for interferometry to, to go extra galactic. I would say the extra galactic in the, the exoplanets is our focus right now, other than the, the galactic center. Mm -hmm. Okay. Thank you, Frank, for a great talk and lots of good questions. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure.
Okay, uh, let's move on to the next talk from uh, Janelle Walsh from Texas A&M. Um, Janelle, you can share your screen. Um, so, you know, uh, in we've been talking about interferometry, but without interferometry directly, we can uh, sort the uh, dynamics inside the near the uh, black holes by looking at the spectroscopy. And that's what Janelle is gonna tell us is the spectroscopy work, uh, I think, uh, around the black holes, please, Janelle. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about supermassive black holes in, in nearby galaxies. And I'll discuss our current census of local black holes that we've obtained through dynamical studies, uh, as well as some outstanding questions. And of course, the you know, exciting prospects for gaining insight into the interplay between black holes and galaxies in the future. So yeah, supermassive black holes reside at the centers of essentially every massive galaxy. And the best dynamical evidence we have comes from our own galaxy, of course, where we can track the paths of individual stars as they orbit very close to the black hole. Beyond the Milky Way, black holes have been dynamically detected in about 100 galaxies to date. So there are three main methods for dynamically measuring black hole masses, and they involve modeling the observed kinematics of stars, gas disks, and water maser disks. So stellar dynamical modeling is the most widely used method, since the motions of stars always reflect the underlying gravitational potential. However, extracting a secure black hole mass measurement from the observed kinematics can be challenging due to the complexity of the models, which are also computationally expensive to calculate. The models can also be subject to a number of systematic effects, such as mass degeneracies between the black hole, stars, and dark matter, as well as assumptions that are made about the intrinsic shape of the galaxy, like whether it's axisymmetric or triaxial. In contrast, gas dynamical modeling is conceptually simple, but gas can be influenced by non-gravitational forces. And so the main assumption of circular rotation needs to be verified. Also, at least in the case of ionized gas disks, often the observed velocity dispersion is larger than what you would see or expect from just bulk rotational motion alone. And so that intrinsic velocity dispersion could be dynamically important. And if so, it should be included in the models in some way to prevent a biased black hole mass measurement. And in a few cases, black hole masses have been measured using megamaser disks in active galaxies. So this technique provides very strong constraints on the black hole mass, as we're talking about subparsec scale circumnuclear disks that are observed deep within the black hole's gravitational potential. Unfortunately, such disks are rare. Uh, they require special physical conditions and nearly edge on inclinations to reduce the maser ampl amplification. Um, there can also be departures from Keplerian rotation due to significant gravitational contributions from the disks themselves. So dynamically detecting black holes requires high angular resolution observations where you're probing the innermost regions of galaxies where the gravitational potential from the black hole dominates. Uh, so that's the black hole sphere of influence. So that can be small. Um, so for example, for a typical supermassive black hole with a mass of about 10 to the eight solar masses, the black hole sphere of influence is roughly tens of parsecs. So with the current observational facilities, trying to resolve those small scales, we're really limited to studying only the nearby galaxies, so objects within 100 megaparsecs. So the Hubble Space Telescope, with its great angular resolution, has therefore played a fundamental role in detecting black holes over the past about 25 years. From these high angular resolution observations, we find that the masses of black holes correlate with the large scale bulge properties of the host galaxy. So there've been a number of correlations that have been found over the years, but here are two of the more well-studied relations between the black hole mass and stellar velocity dispersion or M sigma and the black hole mass and bulge luminosity or ML. So these relationships suggest that somehow black holes and galaxies grow, uh, grow together, they co-evolve, uh, but the details are very poorly understood. So a cosmic census of local black holes has far reaching implications for galaxy evolution, but currently the local black hole mass census is highly incomplete. And this is particularly true for low mass black holes below about a few times 10 to the seven solar masses and for high mass black holes above about a few times 10 to the nine solar masses. So this leaves major questions regarding the distribution of black hole masses with host galaxy properties. So with the current measurements, things like the slope uh, intrinsic scatter and even the shape of the correlations for low and high mass black holes are not well established. 
For example, recent progress detecting high mass black holes in brightest cluster galaxies hint that these objects may lie above M sigma, but there's still too few available measurements to firmly characterize the scaling relations at the upper end. The uncertainties are equally severe at the opposite end, where spiral galaxies with low mass black holes may exhibit scatter below both the M sigma and ML relationships. Um, and new measurements in low mass early type galaxies also show signs of deviations below the scaling relations. Also another issue is that black hole mass measurements have been made in galaxies that are not representative of the local galaxy population. So here I'm showing a plot of galaxy K band luminosity and size. And these green dots are showing galaxies with published dynamical black hole mass measurements. And for comparison, the gray contours are showing the nearby galaxy population from Sloan. So as you can see, the black hole mass measurements have been made in a bias set of galaxies. At a given luminosity, galaxies with small sizes relative to the nearby galaxy population have been preferentially targeted. However, it's really important to properly sample this luminosity size or equivalently mass size parameter space. So as you move in this direction, a whole bunch of galaxy properties change Things like the stellar velocity dispersions, the gas content, the bulge fractions, the mass to light ratios, the stellar populations, and morphology. Also, galaxies that grow through different channels end up on different regions of this plot. So clearly, we need to do a better job of sampling this important parameter space in order to obtain a more complete census of local black holes in a wider range of galaxies that have experienced diverse evolutionary pathways. So our knowledge of how black holes and galaxies are connected has grown tremendously, but there's obviously still a lot left to be learned. As I just described, the local black hole mass census is incomplete, and we still don't have a good physical understanding of the primary mechanisms that drive these empirical correlations between black holes and galaxies. We therefore need more precise black hole mass measurements at the extremes of the black hole mass scale and over a wider range of galaxies that have undergone different evolutionary histories. And we need to better quantify the magnitude and distribution of the intrinsic scatter of the relations. Moreover, other uh, fundamental questions remain unanswered. So just as a few examples, um, do black holes and galaxies grow in symbiosis with each other over time? Or does the growth of the black hole precede that of the host galaxy or vice versa? How do, um, are there black holes in low mass galaxies with masses less than the Milky Way or in globular clusters? How do supermassive black holes form? What are their initial seed masses? And how can they acquire so much mass so quickly after the Big Bang? So now I just kind of want to highlight some recent observational and modeling advances that have allowed us to at least start to address some of these questions. OK, so HST has played a fundamental role in detecting black holes over the past two decades. More recently, though, significant progress has been made using adaptive optics, AO, on large ground-based telescopes. So AO can deliver similar angular resolutions as HST, but has the added advantage of being used with larger telescopes, and it operates in the near infrared. So that means that galaxies that were previously pretty tough to observe with HST because they were too faint or maybe a little too dusty can instead be studied in great detail with AO on large telescopes. So as a result, AO has contributed some of the most massive and least massive black hole mass measurements ever made and everything in between. And this includes studies of you know, giant elliptical galaxies with several billion solar mass black holes, all the way down to low mass early type galaxies with sub million solar mass black holes. Given the uh, extensive observational and modeling effort involved in just a single determination, the approach that has been used for years is to measure one or a few black holes at a time. But advancing the field also requires examining large homogeneous data sets of carefully selected samples. So one such survey was uh, conducted with AO uh, Assisted Symphony on the VLT. So they're producing 25 dynamical black hole masses with galaxies selected to explore poorly populated regions of the black hole scaling relations. So that includes high velocity dispersion, early type galaxies, low velocity dispersion and pseudo bulge galaxies and merger remnants. So we're also carrying out a large black hole program at Gemini North. Uh, we've been allocated 253 hours uh, over the next few years to measure black hole masses through stellar dynamical modeling methods uh, in 31 galaxies using the integral field spectrograph NIFS assisted by adaptive optics. 
So earlier I showed this plot and I highlighted how the current dynamical black hole mass measurements have been made in galaxies that are not representative of the local galaxy population. So our program is a, um, aimed at addressing that a troublesome bias. So here in red are the galaxies in our sample. So our sample significantly increases coverage of this important parameter space without sampling, sampling the already well-populated region within the dotted oval. So our sample uh, spans a wide range of properties you know, by design. For example, the stellar velocities versions range from 60 to 300 kilometers per second. Also, our sample contains a number of spiral galaxies. We'll nearly double the number of black hole mass measurements made in spiral galaxies which is a regime that largely has not been tackled with stellar dynamical modeling techniques. So far, we have completed NIFS observations for 12 of the galaxies in the sample. Um, so these 12 galaxies already enhance the diversity of black hole hosts. We've observed the largest, most luminous galaxy in the sample, as well as lower luminosity galaxy at different effective radii. And then here are just some spectra um, extracted at the nucleus and then about an arc second away for the six galaxies that we most recently finished observing. So the data quality here really are excellent. So from those absorption lines, we can map out the stellar kinematics as a function of spatial location. And that's what you're seeing here for two of the galaxies in the sample. Um, so this is a map of the velocity. So both of these galaxies are rotating. This is a map of the velocity dispersion. Both of these galaxies show central velocity dispersion peaks. Uh, in this case, to values of 370 and 60 kilometers per second. Uh, so again, you can see we really do have a wide range of galaxies in our sample. We've also found some interesting cases. Uh, so this is a rotating edge on early type galaxy where there's actually a decrease in the velocity dispersion at the center. So this sigma drop could imply a non-detection of a black hole, which would still be interesting because that would mean this galaxy lies well below both the current M sigma and ML relations. But the sigma drop could also result from a dynamically cold component of stars at the nucleus. So dynamical models will provide more information and we'll be able to distinguish between those two scenarios. So um, besides the AO observations, we have completed HST images for all 31 galaxies in three filters with WIF-C3. We also have the entire sample observed with the integral field unit LRS2 on the Hobby Eberly telescope, and then even wider field IFUs, virus P and virus W uh, on the 2.7 meter telescope at McDonald. So we're constructing orbit-based stellar dynamical models. Um, so the main assumption here is that the galaxy's gravitational potential consists of contributions from the black hole, stars, and dark matter. So the stellar potential is determined by deprojecting the observed surface brightness, assuming a viewing orientation and a stellar mass to light ratio. We then set up orbits and then we integrate orbits in that potential. We assign weights to the orbits such that the superposition reproduces the observed kinematics from the spectroscopy and then the um, surface brightness, say from the HST image. And then we just calculate a whole bunch of different models varying the parameters of interest like the black hole mass um, and we're looking for the model that most closely matches the data. So when doing that for one of the galaxies, PGC 12557, we find a black hole mass of 2.3 times 10 to the nine solar masses. So these are the contours of chi squared as a function of black hole mass and mass to light ratio after marginalizing over the other parameters. And then this is just a comparison between the NIFS and LRS2 uh, kinematics and then the best fit model in green. So with our black hole mass, uh, PGC12557 is consistent with M sigma, but is a positive outlier from ML, even when conservatively using the galaxy's total luminosity. So it turns out that PGC12557 looks similar to other local galaxies that are positive outliers from ML that are shown in red. All of these galaxies are early type galaxies and are compact. So they have effective radii of one to three kiloparsecs, um, and those are small for their luminosities, which are K-band luminosities of about 10 to the 11 solar luminosities. So that corresponds to stellar masses of about 10 to the 11 solar masses, and they have large central stellar velocity dispersions. Um, so these galaxies host some very massive black holes, but they look very different from the kinds of galaxies you would actually expect to find at the upper end of the black hole scaling relations. So instead of looking like the giant ellipticals and the brightest cluster galaxies like NGC 1275, 
these local compact galaxies like NGC 1277 instead look similar to the typical massive quiescent galaxies at a redshift of two, the so-called red nuggets. So since these local compact galaxies look very similar to the redshift two red nuggets, they could be relics. So the redshift two red nuggets are thought to grow in size and mildly in mass through a series of mergers to produce today's massive early type galaxies. So instead, our sample of local compact galaxies that I'm talking about may not have undergone the same mergers to build up the outskirts of their galaxies. So if true, then these overmassive black holes and these potential redshift two red nuggets could suggest that black hole growth precedes that of the host galaxy. So in addition to AO on large telescopes, we now have these very sensitive wide field IFUs like MUSE on the VLT and KCWI on CAC. So these provide very efficient ways to hunt for extremely high mass black holes. Such high mass black holes are difficult to detect because they're rare. So you have to search for them over larger distances and because they are expected to be found in the most massive galaxies, which tend to have cord surface brightness profiles. So lower mass elliptical galaxies tend to show these rising light profiles, uh, like the ones you're seeing here in the gray lines. Uh, in contrast, higher mass elliptical galaxies tend to show a deficit of stars at the center. So like you're seeing here with the red lines. So it's really quite challenging to obtain the high signal to noise observations needed to reliably measure the stellar kinematics in these faint galaxy cores. So as an example, HOME 15A is the brightest galaxy of the cluster of L85, and it was observed with MUSE. So this galaxy has a very faint uh, diffuse stellar core. So the core is actually two magnitudes fainter than uh, the depleted cores of any other massive early type galaxy that's been dynamically modeled so far. So despite this faint core, with just an hour on source, they were able to get high signal to noise spectra over this one by one arc minute field. And using stellar dynamical models, they found a black hole mass of four times 10 to the 10 solar masses. So this is the largest black hole detected to date. The stellar dynamical modeling uh, technique is a powerful tool. So it not only gives us the black hole mass, but we can also study the galaxy's stellar orbital distribution, test core formation scenarios, and infer galaxy assembly histories. So in this case, given the tangentially biased orbits within the core and the light profile, uh, they find that home 15A is consistent with a merger remnant between two early type galaxies that already had depleted cores. Sorry, one second. I don't know why it's not advancing. Oh, here we go. Okay. <laughs> okay, so besides uh, the observational improvements uh, with AO and these wide field, highly sensitive IFUs, there have also been efforts to improve stellar dynamical models. So a couple of recent triaxial codes have been developed. Um, almost all of the stellar dynamical modeling so far has been made used assuming axis symmetry, but being able to explore triaxiality uh, will be important for modeling the highest mass galaxies, as well as features like bars. So going forward, these triaxial codes will certainly have an impact on both the upper and lower ends of the black hole scaling relations. In addition, there have been improvements made to existing codes, such as speeding them up and updating orbital libraries. And there's been work to constrain models, not just with the observed stellar kinematics, but also incorporating stellar population information, like stellar ages and metallicities. Okay, so let me switch over to gas dynamical measurements. So up until a few years ago, almost all of the black hole mass measurements made from rotating gas disks came from HST observations of ionized gas. But molecular gas from radio observations now offers an attractive alternative. So the gas dynamical modeling assumes that the gas participates in circular rotation in a thin disk. And the dynamically cold, dense molecular gas is likely to have less turbulent motion compared to the warmer ionized gas disks. So one of the major systematics associated with gas dynamical modeling is likely to be less of a concern with radio observations. Also, the data cubes that we get from radio interferometry provide us with more complete spatial coverage of the gas disk. And that's especially true compared to the you know, few spectra that we can extract from the HST apertures. 
So this means with better spatial coverage, we can place tighter constraints on parameters like the disc inclination angle and the position angle, uh, which of course impact the inferred black hole mass. So the first ever black hole mass measurement made from CO emission was several years ago using the radio facility Karma. So here the black hole sphere of influence was just barely resolved, even though this is a very nearby galaxy. Uh, and the observation required tens of hours to complete. Nevertheless, it opened up a new way of measuring black hole masses. So since then, ALMA has provided this huge step up in terms of sensitivity and angular resolution compared to previous radio facilities. So we're now able to routinely map molecular gas within the black hole sphere of influence of many nearby galaxies. And we're able to achieve the precision black hole mass measurements needed to really advance the field. So there's been an uptick in the number of ALMA-based black hole masses in just the last couple of years. And now the number of molecular gas dynamical black hole masses is about equal to the number of ionized gas dynamical black hole masses. So with ALMA, both the low and high uh, black hole masses can be probed and we can study black holes across uh, galaxies that span the Hubble sequence. So I've been part of a collaboration that's been using ALMA to carry out black hole mass measurements in this way. So we're observing um, these early type galaxies that are expected to be found at the upper end of the black hole scaling relations that host regular dust disks in HST images. So such dust morphology strongly suggests the presence of cleanly rotating molecular gas. So all our programs combined with similar data in the archive really show that there are a number of promising targets for molecular gas dynamical modeling. Um, and here are some of the examples. So over here are the CO flux maps, and you can see that there's a wide range in the morphologies. And over here are the radial velocity maps, and they show that these disks are in fairly regular rotation. So this really just highlights the scientific opportunity afforded by ALMA to take an accurate census of local black holes. So for the gas dynamical modeling in its most basic form, uh, the assumption again is that the gas rotates in a thin disk. So at each radius in the disk, you determine the circular velocity relative to the systemic velocity based on the enclosed mass, where that comes from the black hole mass and the extended stellar mass distribution. The model is generated on a velocity field um, on a subsampled pixel grid that's projected onto the plane of the sky for the given value of inclination. And the intrinsic uh, line profiles are assumed to be Gaussian and are centered on the projected line of sight velocity at each point on the subsampled pixel grid, and they're given some intrinsic width. After rebinning back down to the native pixel scale, we convolve with the ALMA beam and we directly compare the model data cube to the observed data cube uh, to find the best combination of parameters. Three minutes to go, Janelle. Okay, great, thanks. So just as an example, here's NGC 3258. Uh, so this is a nearby elliptical galaxy um, and we got brief cycle two ALMA observations at 0.4 arc second resolution. So you can see that there is really um, this central high velocity emission uh, here, but the Keplerian upturns are not that well resolved. So we went back in cycle four and got 0.1 arc second resolution in ALMA observations. And this is what the position Bossy diagram looks like. So here, uh, the Keplerian upturns are really, really clear. So this is a really beautiful position velocity diagram. So we fit rotating disk models that also allow for slight warp in the disk um, to the cycle four observations. And we found a black hole mass of 2.3 times 10 to the nine solar masses with a statistical uncertainty of just 0.2%, a systematic uncertainty of about 0.6%, and then a 12% uncertainty due to the distance. So this is the most precise black hole mass measurement made for any early type galaxy. And it actually rivals some of the maser black hole mass measurements made in spiral galaxies. So yeah, with the last few minutes, let me kind of look ahead here to the future. So I'm only going to focus on one of the fundamental questions I posed earlier, whether black holes and galaxies grow in lockstep with one another. In other words, is there a redshift evolution in the black hole scaling relations? Currently, we can't even begin to answer that question directly. The best we can do is try to answer it indirectly, say by um, looking for um, relics of higher redshift galaxies, like possibly the compact galaxies I mentioned earlier, or by measuring um, the broad emission lines in EGN. 
So with future facilities, we should be able to directly search for redshift evolution by dynamically measuring black holes in various redshift bins and comparing to the local relations. So searching for redshift evolution in the scaling relations is best accomplished with the high mass black holes. So for example, with a 30 meter telescope and AO, the black hole sphere of influence of a 10 to the 10 solar mass black hole can actually be resolved throughout the universe and the black hole sphere of influence of a 10 to the nine solar mass black hole can be resolved out to a redshift of about 0.3. So we obviously uh, need to worry about getting high enough signal in order to carry out these dynamical black hole mass measurements. And that's obviously an important point, but angular resolution for these high mass black holes will no longer be a concern. Of course, tracing the redshift evolution in the black hole scaling relations requires having the redshift zero relation correct. So having independent and precise measurements of these high mass black holes locally through various dynamical uh, methods and through say imaging with NGEHT would be a great first step. So the stellar and gas dynamical black hole mass measurements in particular suffer from several but different systematic effects. And so direct comparison between the two methods so far has returned mixed results. So getting separate masses, um, say from NGEHT, would help us in drawing conclusions regarding the consistency of the two methods and the subsequent effects on the black hole scaling relations. It would also be helpful um, for determining the intrinsic scatter in the scaling relations. So again, these are all just essential ingredients if we ultimately want to determine if there is a redshift evolution in the black hole relations and whether black holes and galaxies do grow in lockstep with one another or if one precedes the other. So yeah, just to summarize here, the local black hole mass census is incomplete and we really don't know exactly what roles black holes play in galaxy evolution. So we really need more measurements at the extremes of the black hole mass scale and over a wider range of galaxies that have grown in different ways. And so far, uh, recent progress has been made using AO and large ground-based telescopes, new wide field, highly sensitive integral field units, ALMA, as well as updates to the modeling methods. And in the future, we hope to probe new regimes, for example, tracing directly the redshift evolution in the black hole scaling relations. But of course, this requires getting the redshift zero relation correct. So having as many independent methods to measure these black hole masses is really important. So yeah, thank you, that's everything. Thanks very much, Janelle, for a comprehensive talk on the spectroscopic landscape. Now, can we have questions? Who would like to ask some questions? Is Richard, perhaps? Yeah, thanks, uh, Janelle. That's a great talk. Um, and, uh, you know, we have an another method of measuring black hole masses. It's through direct imaging with EHT. And uh, that favored the um, uh, stellar dynamics for uh, M87. Have they uh, pinpointed where the gas dynamics uh, were? Uh, systematically uh, disfavored in that case. And um, uh, when you are looking at very large uh, supermassive black holes, uh, there may be uh, some of the black hole mass potentially in a binary. I'm wondering what are the uh, signatures of the presence of a binary with a roughly comparable, uh, let's say a few percent or more, uh, of the mass of the larger black hole, would that be easily found as a perturbation in, uh, in stellar dynamics? And how would gas dynamics find that particular uh, potential systematic effect? Yeah, no, great questions. Yeah, so let me, let me take the first one. So going back to M87, uh, so like you said, the EHT result agrees with the stellar dynamical result, but um, is not consistent with the gas dynamical result. Um, so there, um, I actually do think that both the dynamical results do warrant um, re-examination. So with the gas dynamical side, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, it is a simplistic model. So complete, like adding more complexity to the model, as long as the data allows for it, is something that could be explored. So for example, it doesn't have to be a thin disk or, you know, maybe there is some radial motion inflowing. Uh, so that, those are all things that are not accounted for in the gas dynamical models. Um, so yeah, it's something that potentially, you know, going back to the um, HST-STIS data, 
and seeing if the data will allow for additional complexity is something that can be done. Uh, it's a little unfortunate that there's not um, CO emission in the ALMA data that exists for M87, because I think that would be a much cleaner case. Um, so there we're finding with the molecular gas compared to ionized gas studies, there really is not a lot of intrinsic velocity dispersion. So uh, with the ALMA gas dynamical measurements that have been done, the kind of additional velocity dispersion that needs to be included in order to match the line with is on the order of like five kilometers per second. So the, you know, the, the molecular gas is really a much cleaner case. It's just unfortunate we can't do that with M87. Um, on the stellar dynamical side for M87, there are, you know, assumptions were made as well. Um, so it's great that it agrees with the EHT result, uh, but that doesn't mean that the stellar dynamical mass shouldn't be re-examined either. So their axisymmetry was assumed, and there was also not a lot of, um, because of the AGN, the stellar kinematics right at the center could not be extracted. Um, and so kind of, at least on the modeling side, what we can do with the existing NIFS data is incorporate uh, triaxiality. And there are some hints in the stellar kinematics uh, for evidence of triaxiality in there. Um, so we're starting to see some minor axis rotation, for example, with larger scale data that gets modeled. Um, I think that, okay, so that's everything with M87. So then your second question had to do with binaries. Um, so yeah, with the kinematics, both stellar and gas kinematics, you know, this is all just the enclosed mass. So we actually are not sensitive with the scales that we're probing here uh, to, to seeing um, any dynamical signatures in, in, our, in our kinematics um, in our, with our modeling. So kind of going to say other um, wavelengths um, and like X-ray or radio observations, maybe you can see that, you know, there's like dual nuclei, but for, for the galaxies I've been talking about, um, yeah, we're just kind of not sensitive to that with, with our kinematics and our modeling. Okay, right, so we, we, we've run out of time. Uh, so Rizia and Hope, please keep your questions and either ask them in chat or, uh, or better yet at the summary session, okay? So we have to uh, keep to the next talk already. Thanks very much, Janelle, for a great talk. Okay, uh, Sarah, Sarah Burks Spaloa will talk about a uh, nanograph. Uh, you know, the uh, LIGO is not the only way to look for a gravitational wave because they are only looking at the relatively small mergers, small black hole mergers. For the big, bigger ones, supermassive ones, uh, the timing measurement from pulsar is very important. And Sarah will tell us about the future in uh, using nanograph uh, techniques. Please, Sarah. Hey, all. Yeah, thanks for having me here. It's a pleasure to be here among this really crowd of world-changing scientists. It's, it's great. Um, but yeah, so as Paul introduced, I'm here to talk to you about um, observing binary systems of supermassive black holes and doing this in two techniques, which is gravitational waves and electromagnetic emission, with the goal of doing this as, you know, looking at multi-messenger sources, um, but particularly focusing on the radio. And a lot of this work has been done with this really great big collaboration, the Nanograv collaboration, um, and my WV team of, of a couple of different students and postdocs. So just let's, just, let's get this started and saying simply, we really only expect to see binary supermassive black holes inside of merger remnants. So if you zoom down into the center of a merger remnant, um, you might find a binary supermassive black hole. And their origin really makes them set up well to be potentially great multi-messenger sources, particularly as active galactic nuclei that have some kind of peculiar signature. So something unique that sets them apart from another AGN. So the gas gets funneled in by that merger, ignites hopefully two active galactic nuclei. Now, the main thing I wanted to communicate to you today is that along with other wavelengths and of course a ton of other instruments, um, multi-messenger astronomy um, can be done in a sort of unique way with radio waves alone. And that's using um, pulsar timing techniques and very long baseline interferometry. Um, so those are the two things I'll, I'll focus mostly on today. <clears throat> now, I wanted to just set this up. I know, um, Alberto gave a talk that introduced some of these ideas yesterday. In case some of you weren't here, I'll, I'll review a little bit of a little bit of a get, uh, excuse me a little bit of it again. So here I'm showing kind of a visceral way the timescales over which we actually see 
binary binary black holes at a very for, um, at a variety of masses. And you can see here, LIGO is going to be probing these very fast moving sources, things like the scale of seconds orbits, um, and very massive objects um, in terms of stars, so 100 solar masses. LISA will be observing hopefully sometime in by the um, mid 2030s, um, these intermediate mass supermassive black hole systems, where they're actually orbiting sometime along the, the um, time scale of hours to days. Those are the time scales that LISA is sensitive to. On the other hand, pulsar timing arrays, and we hope that our first discovery and believe that our first discovery is going to be this decade, and I'll, I'll show you some evidence of that today. Um, these have a unique view of the supermassive black holes and the biggest binary supermassive black holes in the universe. So these are these gigantic 10 to the eighth or even, you know, I say 10 to the 11, that's just to encompass the entire range, um, at least, you know, 10 to the 10 to the nine, 10 to the 10 solar mass binary systems. And, you know, this is of course animated here, this, this last graphic, it's just orbiting very, very slowly because the orbits we expect to see are on the time scale of weeks to decades. So very, very long. And um, correspondingly, if you just think about Keplerian orbits and what the separation should be at those time scales, if you have a circular binary, this corresponds to something like milliparsec to roundabout parsec separations of the binary black holes that pulsar timing arrays are observing. So that's nice and, and well separated and bodes well for interesting multi-messenger observations of these objects. Now, pulsar timing arrays use this property of pulsars that they're really, really well timed. And particularly the fastest spinning pulsars, these what we call millisecond pulsars. So they're spinning once every millisecond. So again, these are really extreme objects. They're the mass of the sun, but very compact and spinning about as fast as a dentist drill, which is pretty wild. Um, what I'm showing here is the sensitivity we have to measuring the exact period of this particular pulsar at midnight on January 2000. And you could see there's, you know, there's something like 17 significant figures here. So this is an insanely precise measurement. And the reason we are able to try to detect gravitational waves with pulsars is first, they are so precise in their rotation that they're essentially these little ticking clocks out in space. That allows us to have Earth here looking at these little test mass little clocks floating naturally out in our galaxy. We have many of them sitting in our galaxy we were able to observe them and look for correlated effects happening at Earth and at those pulsars. Um, and here's just a graphic showing all of the different arrays and, um, and telescopes that are currently looking at um, pulsars to try to make this pulsar timing array. Now the idea is here that we have some source that's in some other galaxy or otherwise just very, very far away. The wavefront is coming out of that that, that galaxy and out of that source. So here I'm showing a binary black hole as the source of a gravitational wave. And this one is showing this episodic, nice sinusoidal gravitational wave, wave front passing out. And it hits the pulsar and shows some kind of distortions in space time, hits Earth and shows some distortions in space time as that strain front comes through. So you can imagine as we're trying to observe that pulsar, we see it, you know, you could think of it as receding and coming. So some kind of shift in the Doppler effect, but ultimately we see it as a variation in the spin of that pulsar. So we're looking at the spin rate of that pulsar. And what I'm showing here is what we call timing residuals for three different pulsars. So one's in blue, one's in red, one's in black. And I've injected, this is simulated data, obviously, there's a very bright sinusoid in here. And I've injected a, a relatively nearby and very massive binary supermassive black hole, just to demonstrate that each little point here represents one observation of a single pulsar. And you could see that each of these are, are laid out sort of, you know, across a time scale of something like 10 years. So pulsar timing data sets range right now from between like, you know, a couple, maybe 10 years to, to 20 or 30 years for some pulsars. Um, and this means that if you think about the sinusoid passing through the pulsar timing data and jiggling our pulsars around in this way, we actually have time scales that we can detect these binary supermassive black holes between you know the, the cadence of our observations, so how far apart are these points, to the full time scale of the data. So in this case, this um, looks like it's about a, a four-year orbital period binary. For a circular binary, you get two gravitational wave cycles per orbit. So one orbit is, is two of those cycles there. Okay, so quickly I just wanted to present the, um, 
the Nanograv data set, which is the, the collaboration that I've been working most closely with over the years, at least recent years. Um, so Nanograv is this North American pulsar timing array effort, which is part of the, the broader international pulsar timing array effort that we showed earlier, that I showed that, that plot of earlier. Um, and I just wanted to note that at this point, the Nanograv data set is, I think, one of the most sensitive um, data sets in the world for a discrete pulsar timing data set. Um, these are just points representing how much data we have over time for all of our different pulsars. And our most recent data set that we've been using has 47 millisecond pulsars, um, something like a span of 12 and a half years of data on average, with some variance. You know, some pulsars got added a little bit later. Um, multiple different telescopes, including, you know, Green Bank here and until recently Arecibo Observatory. Um, and we've been observing these with something like a three to four week cadence for this very long time. So it's been a vast amount of work by a lot of different scientists to do this great science. Um, so we can detect signals and binary supermassive black holes at this point up to maybe two or three decades in orbital frequency. Um, I just wanted to note too that this is our current data set that's currently being published and there was a pub publication in December that came out reporting on gravitational wave background. Um, but we do have the next data set already in hand. It takes a while to run um, the detection algorithms. So, so we're, we're now currently working on our 15 year data set. Um, there's a lot of efforts right now to get the IPTA to work together as one big um, collaboration. And it's been hard going over the years, but I think we're, we're really getting there. And at this point, um, we're really at the point where this IPTA will come together and get the most sensitive data in the next probably year or two. Um, and that would extend this, the baselines out to 20 years, roughly doubling the data size, potentially doubling our sensitivity, and again, getting us even longer period binaries. OK, so Alberto um, Cezana yesterday introduced the idea of a gravitational wave background. Um, but I wanted to point out that pulsar timing arrays will discover lots of different types of signals. So one is this stochastic background. It's this noisy background made up of all the humming binary supermassive black holes in the universe superimposed on each other. We will also likely con um, detect continuous waves, which are discrete systems. So this is something like, you know, resolving a, uh, you know, a radio point source from a confused background. Um, we do expect to detect a large number of these as our sensitivity grows. Um, I'm not gonna talk today about bursts with memory. This is something that can happen. That's kind of an oddity of gravitational wave science um, can happen when two black holes at the moment of, of coalescence. Um, so I have a, a plot here that's showing the gravitational wave spectrum and it's showing the strength of individual um, black holes as little blue dots here. So some kind of gravitational strain, which is the, the measure of the strength of these sources as a function of their gravitational wave frequency. And you can see there's many, many, many contributing sources, something like at least thousands to tens of thousands of binary supermassive black holes contributing strongly to the pulsar timing wave band, which runs something like a nanohertz to probably just above this at a, a microhertz. Um, the gravitational wave background has a lot of power at low frequencies. And you can see that it's just the sum up of all these very many sources at, at um, wider separations emitting at um, at low frequency and gradually gets um, lower and lower and lower power as you get fewer sources um, as they start to coalesce. And of course they, they evolve more rapidly as they get closer. Um, I think that's all I wanted to say here. But um, so I'll talk a little bit about the background but I wanted to focus, sorry, the background, I wanted to focus mostly on um, continuous waves in this talk. Um, but I did want to mention that, you know, there is a lot of rich science that will go on with this gravitational wave background um, and measuring its amplitude and its spectral shape will really make some interesting bulk population statements on black hole mass um, and host relations, redshift dependent merger rates, merger time scales, and all these things. Um, and a lot of the stuff that uh, Janelle was just talking about. So pulsar timing rays can really have a unique contribution to that, which I think will be really interesting. Okay, so here's where all the pulsar astronomers' minds are right now. I think, I think all of them, if not most of them. Now, um, this is a search I'm, I'm showing for the gravitational wave background in nanograv data. And what I'm showing is that we first search for an uncorrelated signal. So we know that gravitational waves should be quadrupolar, so they should show some correlated signal for these pulsars sitting around the sky. Um, but the first thing we do in general searches is search for just some kind of uncorrelated signal. And what, what, what has been happening over the past few data sets with nanograv is that we are unable 
to, um, to prove that there is an uncorrelated, essentially, set of pulsars in our array. And it looks like um, what we're finding is an increasingly a loud, what we call a, a common noise process in all the pulsars. So every single pulsar is showing some kind of red noise. So where you sort of get a random walk in, um, in the pulsar data, a lot of low frequency noise, just like you would expect to see with the gravitational wave background. Um, and I'm showing this plot here that's basically showing, um, you know, the amount of noise in the pulsar data set at a particular frequency. At some point, it levels out to um, just a Gaussian noise floor. And you can see down at these low frequencies, we get more and more power coming in. And you could fit that power law that's common to all the pulsars. And you can try to model this as a gravitational wave background. And that's what I'm showing here in terms of the amplitude of that background at, um, at a frequency of one over a year as, as a function of its spectral index. Um, so you can see just fitting all of our, all of our data points, we, we get this little um, banana over here. Um, but that doesn't seem to be a great fit um, just because it, you, it seems like there's maybe a broken power law happening here. Um, so if we try to model that broken power law, we can see that the amplitude and this spectral index we're detecting is actually consistent with a number of the sources we expect to be making these gravitational wave signals. Okay, so let's not get ahead of ourselves because we don't yet think this is a gravitational wave background. We hope it is, but, um, and that's why, you know, we're making these plots to test whether it, it might be. But what we're trying to do at this point is basically put this through a ton of wash cycles and make sure it doesn't, you know, get, get that stain out. Um, so one of the things we do is look to whether we're actually seeing some kind of monopolar signature, like you would see with just like a clock error. Um, and for instance, the you know, atomic time scale, which all of our pulsar timing um, array measurements are referenced to. You might also have some kind of unmodeled like solar system object, which is creating a dipolar signature in the ecliptic plane because you get wobbled in the ecliptic due to this unmodeled um, solar system source. But it appears that all of these, um, all of these sources are, are sort of being shot down um, with our current data. But still, quadrupole is only slightly favored um, over other correlations, and it's not yet strong, so something at like the 2.5 sigma level. And I'm showing here this Hellings and Downs curve that indicates a quadrupolar signature between the correlation of various pairs of pulsars. So this is looking at the correlated signal between each, each point here is a pair of pulsars um, separated at some angle on the sky. And you can see this isn't a fantastic fit, hence the 2.5 sigma, but we have 15 year data in hand that we're of course rapidly trying to analyze to, to look at this and see how it changes with the 15 year data. Um, and our IPTA partners are also coming to, to the rescue and going to tell us whether we have counter evidence for this process or an actual detection. So stay tuned, it should be in the next year that we, we publish this. Um, by the way, all of this work was published um, for the 12 and a half year data set by um, Joseph Simon who led this work. Um, back in December. Okay, so for the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus on continuous waves. Um, and based on predictions referenced here at the bottom of my slide, um, they really should follow just a few years after a gravitational wave detection of the background. Now, I don't want you guys to get tired of zooming. So can you just throw in the chat here, find your little chat window, stick in a number. How many, how many individual continuous wave sources do you think we're gonna detect? by the time NGEHT comes online, which it, it will, of course, right on time in uh, 2030 or so. One. All right, I like the range here. Yeah, somebody has to write 42, of course. Okay, so we're getting ranges one, two, 100, 10,000. We're all order of magnitude astronomers. So a lot of you are correct. Um, and maybe all of you are correct. I don't know, because we don't know yet. We don't know how many we will detect, but we suspect we should be able to detect at least two to 10 discrete sources by 2030. Um, and I will talk about that a little bit today. So here I'm showing just a sky sensitivity map. This is essentially the nanograv horizon map for the 11 year data set. Um, we're currently working on improving this. My student Caitlin Witt is um, running a sensitivity map for the 12 and a half year data set. Um, but you can see that just a couple of years ago, we published this. And in the most sensitive areas of sky, we're out to something like 120 megaparsecs for finding an equal mass 10 to the nine solar mass supermassive black hole binary. Um, 
And this is again, this is a 95 confidence, 95% confidence horizon. So somebody asked yesterday about um, what's the mass ratio limit you can put on M87. I haven't actually run that calculation yet, but it's something like, you know, a, a mass ratio of 100. M87 is 16.4 is megaparsecs. So that's over here somewhere. It's actually at a sort of halfway sensitive part in the sky for nanograv. Um, so we have at least that boost factor. And it is, you know, 10 to the 10, to the 10 solar mass black hole. Um, so it's, it's a lot bigger. Um, it looks like we should be able to put something reasonably good on that. Um, but I also just wanted to show this to point out that you can use these nanograv maps if you think you have a binary black hole in your data somewhere. Use this, you know, go to our papers and use this type of map to estimate whether we should have detected it or not. Um, I think this is a nice way to do that. I wanted to just show this in a slightly different way to highlight that our horizon is rapidly expanding. So here was, um, I think, the, the five-year data set from Nanograv and what our horizon was um, using these, you know, 10 to the 10, 10 to the 9 solar mass black hole binaries out of some kind of like a three-year orbit. Um, the 2019 data went out to something like 120 megaparsecs. But once we get the full IPTA happening in earnest and SKA coming online, we are really going to rapidly expand our horizon and bring in a lot of galaxies into our horizon that we can observe and test and hopefully detect continuous waves from. Um, now, of course, for multi-messenger science, we need two messengers. We don't just need the gravitational waves. We also need electromagnetic emission. And I'm going to spend the rest of the time today talking about electromagnetic signatures of binary supermassive black holes, particularly those in the radio. Now, this is a busy figure, but the main takeaway is this. It's going to take a lot of instruments, including this should have an NG in front of it, but there's EHT. It's going to take a lot of different wavelengths, a lot of different instruments, searching for many different possibilities for signatures, many of which are not confirmed because we don't know whether they will happen or not. Um, and it's going to be combined with PTA observations to actually make multi-messenger science happen. But radio will actually have some unique contribution to this. And one of the main ways it can do that is through observing precession. And there's a lot of great uh, work done by people in the, in the EHT collaboration on this subject, um, both observing and, and modeling these, these sources. Um, so precession is something that's been observed in a pretty large handful of radio AGN monitored on BLBI scales. And it's often attributed to a binary system, the idea being that the second black hole is somehow just you know, reorienting the secretion disk and, and making that jet move around, um, maybe with an equal, you know, equal period to the orbit, um, or maybe some kind of uh, resonant harmonic or something. Of course, there's another explanation for precession and, and man, many others, I'm sure, um, which is this lens lens thuring effect, which we know can happen in in supermassive black holes, just single supermassive black holes. So it's not a surefire thing, but it is a potential observable signature that VLBI can attack. So here's two prime examples of this. Um, this is some work by um, a, a wide number of people showing that you can actually use VLBI to just directly track helical outflows. And then you can go um, like Lister and Smith does, did, go and model these helices and determine you know, their orientation angles and their periods. And then like Kuhn did, you can actually go and try to measure things like you know, the presence of a binary, the mass ratio, and the, the, um, the spin of these black holes, if you have a well enough, well modeled enough um, processing jet. Now, binary supermassive black holes are also called upon often to interpret periodic emission. Um, and here's OJ287, which is a very famed binary supermassive black hole candidate. And it's really amazing. You know, it has optical data way back to the late 1800s. They actually used photographic plates. We've certainly come a long way since then. Um, but you can see these episodic outbursts once every something like 12 years. Um, and Silke Britson did a nice um, um, paper, wrote up a nice paper on how um, she had some very long-term video monitoring that showed um, a harmonic um, period coming out of the radio high, um, long baseline observations. Um, and I think there will also be a, a talk by, by Gopu later today. Um, so please show up to that. I think it's in the afternoon parallel session. Okay. So a couple of examples of observing precession. There's another famous um, example of a precession observation that I wanted to just highlight. Um, this is galaxy 3C66b. And back in 2003, there was an observation published that 
claimed to have detected these elliptical motions in two and eight gigahertz VLBA observations. So you can see they fit this little sinusoid and it's all very cute and has this nicely, um, you know, one year orbital period, which is awfully suspicious being one year, but that's okay. Cause you can still go out and say, okay, well, it looks like there might be some kind of binary black hole and that radio jet is processing around. So you're seeing these radio cores oscillating as that jet, jet processes. Three um, minutes so to go, Sarah. Thank you. That's slightly different scales. Now, what's interesting is that this source was big enough and near enough that we were actually able, um, even just back in 2004, to put really stringent limits on the system with pulsar timing arrays. So this is a really nice example of early multi-messenger science. Um, where, you know, if you just simulate what you should see in this data, it's this really immense sinusoid. And Janae, back in 2004, um, with very early nanograv data, uh, or maybe it might have been Parks Pulsar Timing Array data, um, showed that you actually see, you know, nothing. More recently, we've gone back and tried to do this with the latest greatest data set, and we were able to put limits that are far closer to the revised mass, um, which is shown as this orange bar here. Um, I'm showing this as a function of essentially the error you have in the measurement of the frequency, because what we were trying to explore here is, you know, if you have an electromagnetic measurement of a binary supermassive black hole, you might not know its frequency, but if you do know its frequency, your limit goes from, you know, something up here to dropping by roughly an order of magnitude, even if you just approximately know its frequency. So this is a precision of like, you know, an order of magnitude on the frequency measurement. So this really bodes well for the idea that if we can get jet helices and try to find um, those types of sources and model their period based on the you know periodic emission or some kind of helical motion, that we can then do some kind of targeted search in pulsar timing array data and find these objects with much greater um, sensitivity. Okay, so this is all kind of the signatures I've talked about so far inferred emission. And all of you are in the business of direct imaging. So what about direct imaging? And this is a great, um, a great thing to do because of course it provides very clear evidence that you have a binary supermassive black hole. So here's one of the most clearly and strongly evidenced, um, maybe not quite binary, but very close to binary systems. And you have these very flat spectrum radio cores. You can see they're peaking in the gigahertz regime and um, they're about a separation of something like seven parsecs. And one of them has these nice jets flowing out. Um, uh, this Bonsali paper actually went out and measured astrometry of these central objects and showed that the time scale of, of um, the binary time scale is something like 10 to the four years. So quite, quite long, too long for pulsar timing arrays, but still promising in terms of this technique that we can use to actually detect and evidence binary supermassive black holes. So quickly, um, recently we set out to address the question, can we actually resolve any binary AGN in the pulsar timing band? And the answer is a real solid, hopefully yes. Um, it might be possible and I'm, I'm gonna show you why I think that. And here I'm showing two simulated universe. One is a kind of a, a pessimistic or pessimistic one in green and an optimistic one in black. You can see there's a, a bit more brighter and, and uh, more sources in that black one. Um, these lines are the extrapolated um, pulsar timing array sensitivities. And this again is a strain plot, strain versus frequency. And just to, to point out again, these are the kind of long period things, these broadly separated stuff over here are those milli milliparsec separations and very short periods like order of years. Now you can see here, anything above these lines is what we would detect. So by 2030, we actually might expect to detect a large handful of objects in, um, in pulsar timing arrays as continuous wave sources. So what we did was that very simply take that same simulation and apply a bivariate luminosity function to all the galaxies in that simulation to see- Last, which, last one minute, Sarah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, to see which ones lit up as radio and with a luminosity appropriate to the host. Um, here we have all of the things that lit up as radio and you can see that there are actually a few above the line that are dual radio AGN. So that's great. There are also these sources which are dual AGN, but not multi-messenger sources because they're not above that line. They will still contribute interesting things, but um, but we are, you know, it, they're worthwhile discovering, but they won't be directly multi-messenger. One thing we didn't model here, which is worth considering, is 
you know, where is the radio emission quenched? Um, it's likely to be disrupted at some point in these the separation range, but a lot of interesting physics will come from doing that. I'm going to skip that. Here's just a view of what one of these sources would look like with something like the NGVLA and with a pulsar timing data set. And I will conclude there. Um, thanks for listening. So the general idea is that you know, PTAs should be detecting both background and continuous waves in the next decade and possibly before NGEHT comes online. So there will be a lot of interesting science to be done um, with radio observations to try to do direct imaging and helical or periodic motion, whether it's multi-messenger sources or just anything in the PTA band will lead to really great science. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thanks very much, Sarah, for a very nice talk. Questions? Do we have any questions? We can take a couple of questions. I'm looking for hands. Uh, yeah, but Paul, there are also some questions in the chat. OK. Can we read them from the chat? One question was about detectability of OJ-287 by nanograms. Yeah, I can uh, pull the questions out of the chat if you want me to. So yeah, there was one by Marshall. Um, OJ-287 has a very elliptical orbit and another periapse passage in the next few years. Um, can this not purely sinusoidal gravitational wave signal be detected now? Yeah, so as a uh, elliptical source, it will not be purely sinusoidal. Um, because you know you have a lot of different, quite quite different gravitational wave emission at that um, that close passage, right? And quite different as you as you get out further. Um, we are currently working um, with Gopu, who's again giving a talk this afternoon, possibly in mentioning this um, on trying to actually detect elliptical signals. It's a quite a difficult computational problem, but we are we I now have a student that's working on targeting OJ two eight seven in this way. Uh. See, Silky has a, her hand up. Silky. Yeah, Sarah, thanks for this nice talk. That was very, very nice overview of this um, very promising um, observations. So if it's not OJ-287, do you have a better um, source to, to offer where to look for supermassive binary black holes? Is there one that sticks out somehow? That's a good question. You know, I think the best, well, I have a, you know, I have a spreadsheet with all of my favorites on it. There's many of them. But many people are currently going after these sources that have been detected as sinusoids in optical data. So with like the CRTS um, monitoring and Catal you know, Catalina and uh, any mm. future ones that will be discovered with LSST. So these have time scales of something like two to four years of orbit, you know, modeled orbit. Um, mm. So those, those are, seem to be something people think is a promising technique to find you know, candidate binaries. Thanks. So do we want to field one more question from the chat? I see one here from Zen Pen on what is the typical angular resolution of PDA measuring the supermassive black holes? Yeah, I think you mean the, um, the localization of the sources. And I, I do have a slide on that because it's the answer is kind of odd. Let's see if I can find that. So if you take um, you know, depending on the way the pulsars are laid out and where the black hole is in the, in the sky, you will get very different localization of the, the gravitational wave source. Um, so in a great, you know, in a great localization, you'd have maybe still 100 square degrees. If you have, you know, a source that sits in an area where there aren't many pulsars, so you're not very sensitive to it, you will have, you know, thousands of square degrees and roughly, you know, half the sky, potentially. Um, so, you know, the, the luck will kind of depend on how many pulsars we have across the sky. Thank you, Sarah, for telling us about this important technique. I think we are now done for the morning session. I pass it back to the local organizers for any announcements before coffee. I think we're good. Uh, thanks very much. OK, so then it's on to coffee. When should they be back? Uh, we should return in five minutes to stay on schedule. Um, so you'll see a countdown clock on your screen. Okay, please be back in five minutes. Thank you.